Although the ecological and environmental conflict over the usage of DDT was a difficult task to resolve, many cooperative scientists joined together to find an effective and neutral product to combat malaria. Before the 1960s, malaria in the U.S. was commonplace. In 1874, Othmar Zeller, a German pharmacist, had been working on a drug called DDT to eliminate malaria. In 1939, a Swiss chemist tested DDT on mosquitoes. After sharing his results, the chemist named Hermann Mueller received the Nobel Prize. DDT was extremely effective at killing mosquitoes. It was first introduced in World War II and sprayed on the South Pacific to kill malaria. DDT was used extensively in the 40s and regular sprayings of, on trees were common. Inside houses, people bought aerosols of DDT to kill houseflies. All in all, this new insecticide made life easier. But in the 1950s, DDT's problems started to show up. In 1962, Rachel Carson, author of Silent Spring, brought to life the issues with DDT. Her persuasive writing and objective stories made many people rethink DDT. Nearly a decade later, on December 31, 1972, the United States banned DDT. After DDT was banned, many people were upset. For instance, the petrochemical industry was upset because they had made a lot of DDT and they could no longer sell it in the U.S. Farmers were upset because they thought that their productivity rate would drastically drop. And lastly, public health officials worried of an epidemic of malaria. On this side, people worried because of money and health and ultimately valued the people. On the other side of the conflict, there was the effect on the environment. In 1958, medical doctor Charles S. Petty wrote in a medical journal about two cases in which people were negatively affected by DDT and other organic chemicals. One of these cases is about a 44-year-old physician who in 1944 decides to start spending every Sunday working on his large lawn. Later, this person chose to spray DDT attached to a hose. Because this man only wore shorts and a t-shirt, DDT was applied accidentally to his body during each application on the lawn. This man generally experienced weakness of legs and arms, frequent headaches, and difficulties with focusing eyes. And finally, in June 1955, this man collapsed and was immediately hospitalized. In the hospital, nerve damage was found and also was very high concentrations of DDT. After the release from the hospital, this man improved his health but still had chronic muscle weakness and signs of weight loss and anorexia. This case tells how one must be careful with these powerful insecticides and that cases like this may have caused the U.S. to outlaw DDT. When DDT was introduced into the U.S., we didn't notice the decline of our national pride, the bald eagle. In the 1950s, first signs of the decline were observed. Up until around 1970, bald eagles were on the endangered list. Only until around the late 1970s, after DDT's ban, were bald eagles taken off the endangered list. Observe this graph of bald eagles in Colorado. Before 1973, there are few bald eagles, and only in 1979 is there an incline in the amount of these valiant birds. The cause of these birds going on the endangered list is partly because of DDT. DDT causes bird eggs to thin and causes malfunctions in the reproductive organs and overall has an enormous effect on animals and the environment. The government did many things to warn people about DDT. 
To the people, the government said to cut down and stop unnecessary use of this harmful insecticide. The government suggested to not use DDT on edible items and things that humans come in contact with. They also said that DDT can and has caused deaths in the past. The government also said to farmers to not apply DDT to the edible parts of a plant and to not use on milk cows or cows being prepared for slaughter. The farmers were also warned that an entomologist, Dr. P. N. Anand, observed that high concentrations of DDT easily get into milk if a cow is near this harmful insecticide. Still one question. What next? In countries like Africa, where even DDT may be too expensive, how can we arrive at a compromise? Can we just let millions of people, many of them in Africa, die from malaria every year? From our research, the answer is no. I recently spoke with the professor of environmental science at CU, Professor Bob Sievers, who is an artist and a very knowledgeable person, shared his view of this conflict with me. When it was discovered that it was so persistent, it survived so long, and it went through and into uh, other life forms like birds, then people started looking for insecticides that would not have this long lifetime. But there's a trade-off there. The common good requires that people be prudent in trying to avoid disease that can be transmitted then to others. Another example of people solving the problem of malaria and DDT is the Gates Foundation. In 2007, they have pledged to donate $258 million to the research and Ben Nets to help fight malaria. With all these people working together to gather information and objective thoughts, maybe someday, a vaccine, a repellent, or other type of preventative can be made. But until then, millions of children and adults die every year prevented. Its purpose was to fight malaria yet it was sold and bought commercially in aerosol cans to kill houseflies. In this way, DDT changed society. We thought it was a miracle, but the fact was we overused it. All in all, I think the real compromise must be a change in society and the way we act. So what will it be next? If we cre create another preventative or insecticide, will we overuse it? Or we, will we take what we have learned from today from history, from the past, to envision the future so that we don't keep making the same mistakes that we have already made in the past?